Well, good morning and welcome to Victory Baptist Church. We are so glad that you could join us this morning as we worship the Lord together. And I wanted to start out by just telling you a bit about my week. And this week, it was a challenging week for me. I had to say goodbye to a family member who passed away, who I, I love very much, and it is so hard to say goodbye to someone that we love. And I look forward to the day where we won't have to say goodbye anymore, when, when God will wipe every tear from our eye, where there will be no more death, there will be no more mourning, tears, or pain, for we will dwell with God for all eternity. I look forward to that day. However, as we know, for each one of us, there are weeks that are just, they're trials. They challenge us, and I had a week that was challenging. And through that week, I, I kept asking the Lord, there were so many moments I just call out to him, I said, how do I handle this? How, how do I do this? And each time that I called out to him, he answered me. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he, he just kept bringing this one scripture to mind. And if you remember last week, I'd encourage you to memorize 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And as you memorized it and, and spent time with it, I, I asked you to, to watch how God would use that scripture in your life. Because it's so important that we get it into our minds and into our hearts. And God uses it. And so I, I, I took up my own challenge and I worked on memorizing 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, which is all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I was, I was amazed at how I went through my week, how God just continually brought that scripture back to mind and taught me things about it, reminded me things about him. He, re, he reminded me that all scripture is God-breathed, that, that what we have here is all sufficient to direct us and to guide us in life. Even in the hardest, most challenging weeks, his, his word is sufficient. He's given it to us as a gift. And he reminded me that, that in, this, in his word, he, he teaches us what to believe about him. He, he rebukes us in what not to believe. And I know in this week, there's so many people that I had the chance to speak with that just aren't quite sure of what to believe and how to, how to navigate life at times. But the word of God gives us that. It also corrects us and, and trains us in righteousness. It teaches us how to, how to live right before God and how not to. And he gives us his word so that he, he, he can thoroughly equip us for all life's challenges, and he's there with us. And I, I come this morning to praise the Lord for his word. And it's through his word that he sustained me this week. I leaned on Jesus Christ, and he supported me through it. And what I'd love to hear from you, if you took the time to, to, with this verse and memorize this scripture and you watch for God and see how, how he used it in your life, I'd love to hear from you. Send me a message. But this morning we rejoice that we have the word of God that equips us thoroughly for life, for every good work. And it teaches us in here, it says, the holy scriptures make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. We can rejoice this morning because we know that our salvation is found in the Lord. And I encourage you to join with us this morning as we worship the Lord our God. For the Lord is our salvation. Jesus Christ died on a cross for our sin so that we may be set free and have eternal life. Let's worship the Lord together. grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea and I am safe on the solid ground the Lord is my salvation let's sing it this morning I will not fear when darkness 
His strength will help me scale these walls. I'll see the dawn of the rising sun. The Lord is my salvation. saved us from our sin. He has taken it away. And the only response that we have is to give our lives fully to him that we may see his good work within our lives. Lord, let our lives be a gift and offering to you this morning. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. 
This morning, we are going to introduce you to a new song. And the lyrics are straight out of Scripture. That seems to be a theme with the new songs we're introducing, isn't it? This one comes from the Gospels. Jesus sat his disciples down and taught them how to pray. And this morning, we are going to sing the Lord's Prayer. I want us to sing it as if it is a prayer that we are praying ourselves, that we may lift up our praise to God, that he may hear us, and that we can be confident in that fact. Let's sing it together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us up our voices to you this morning. We ask that you would send us your spirit. We ask that you would be with us. We ask that you would give us our daily bread and lead us not into temptation, and that we may serve you for all the days of our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. At this time, we just want to give thanks to the Lord for sustaining us in our lives, for sustaining us uh, through these difficult days, and we know that he'll sustain us in the days ahead. And we want to give him thanks for sustaining the ministry here at Victory Baptist Church through the offerings that we give. And I want to thank you for your continued support, the ministry here. We thank God for all that he does and provides for us. For all good gifts come from above. They come from heaven. They come from our Father. And I was reminded of this this week after singing this song, uh, the Lord's Prayer, and I was, I'd been reading it this week. And the opening line says, Our Father who art in heaven. And we know that God our Father is in heaven. And I was thinking of this, this question, especially as I was thinking about my family as we gathered around at the funeral this week, and I asked this question. Why do we all want to go to heaven? Why? Everybody wants to go to heaven. And it has to do with who's in heaven. It says in that opening line of the prayer, our Father who art in heaven, the reason we all want to go to heaven is because our Father is in heaven. In each one of our hearts, we're created to belong to him and be home with him. 
And really what our, our hearts long for is to be at home with our Father. And we just pray that one day we will see that day come. And that we can be, that God will sustain us until Christ returns for us. And we give thanks this morning for all that he has given us. And so on the bottom of your screen is a way that you can give to the ministry of the church. It's through e-transfer at donation at victorybaptist.ca. Victory, or donation at victorybaptist.ca. And you can give that way. Right now, let's just go before the Lord and just give thanks to him for all that he is doing is just his sustaining power and love. Heavenly Father, we just praise you and we thank you. For we know that all good gifts come from you, our Father in heaven. And you have poured them out lavishly on us. You have sent us your Son, Jesus Christ, in the greatest gift of love, in your generosity. You gave up your Son to pay the penalty for our sin that we may have eternal life that we could look forward to a future with you, that we know that through Christ that one day our hearts will be at home with you, our Heavenly Father, and we will live with you forever. And God, we just praise you and thank you for your sustaining power. Lord, I ask we just lift up those who are, who are struggling this morning, who may have be going through a challenging week, coming through a challenging week, that Lord, you would just sustain them in your love, that they would know the power of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, and through your Holy Spirit that you would just meet with each one. We know that there's many who, who are ill right now. And God, I pray that you, they just know your sustaining power and your healing power, that you just remind them of your word that teaches us, that rebukes us, that corrects us, that trains us in righteousness. And in your word, there's such great promises that we can put our hope and trust in, Lord. Provide those for those who are hurting, that they may be reminded of your great love for us. And Lord, we ask that you just lead us, that you would direct us in your ways, that we may follow you and may be obedient children, prepared to do good works. And Lord, we just thank you uh, for the way that you have provided for this ministry here at Victory Baptist Church, that the good news of Jesus Christ may impact us here in our life and go out from here, reaching out into our community, into our world. And Lord, I pray that through your word that it may not return empty, but you would change lives. You would encourage us in our lives, each one of us. We pray, Lord, that you just accept our offerings this morning as we give to you, for you, Lord, have taught us how to be generous. You have been so generous to us. God, we love you. We thank you for this time that we can gather to worship you. Be present with us, mighty God. I pray that you be with Pastor Jason as he comes to share the word of God with us. May your spirit be upon him and just speak through him. Speak into our hearts this morning, Lord. We need to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. I encourage you to open up your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 for this morning's scripture reading. Today's scripture is 1 John 5, 13 to 21. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him 
and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. Several years ago, at the University of Cambridge, in the chaplain's house, uh, they began to have a discussion. There was an old rug, and it was a very big rug, and it had been there for years and years. No one could remember when it first showed up. In fact, C.S. Lewis stayed in that chaplain house when he was at Cambridge in the 1930s and the 40s, and it had been there during his time. And people began to say, hey, why don't we get rid of this rug? It's old, it's gross, uh, it's got all these stains on it, it's out of date, and we just want to scrap it. As they were getting ready to do that, someone began to do some research into the rug, and they found out that the rug was an old Persian rug, and it was extremely rare. It was apparently worth $4,000 a square meter, and they had a rug that was worth $250,000. It was a great treasure and something so very valuable, but they didn't know what they had. And so for years, they misused it, they abused it, they, they took it for granted, they wiped their feet on it, they spilled food on it. They, they di didn't realize the treasure that was standing underneath their feet. Last week, we began a new series as we are exploring the values of our church, the values that motivate us to go and fulfill our mission. And this week, we're going to continue that series by looking at prayer. And the statement that we have, our value statement for prayer is this, we value prayer as the way we speak with God. But why do we value prayer? prayer. We value prayer because it is effective. It, it does something. If you talk to anyone long enough who has prayed, they are bound to tell you at least one story of the way that they saw a prayer answered in their life. But if we believe that prayer is effective, that doesn't necessarily mean that we always see it that way, nor does it mean that we are very good at praying. I believe prayer is at once the most valued and the most neglected thing in the Christian life. Some of our times of deepest communion with God have been in prayer, and yet so often we fail to pray. And it's a lot like that rug. We have become so accustomed to prayer, I think, and have heard so much talk about prayer. Prayer has been such a part of our life for so long that we have forgotten the treasure that prayer truly is. If you talk to the average person about prayer, you're bound to hear something um, about the fact that they wish they did it more, that their prayer life was deeper or richer, or they'll mention some kind of shortcoming in their prayer life. And sometimes that, that, that lack of prayer is because we don't find time. Some of us, it, it feels unnatural and awkward. Uh, we, we don't quite know what to say, and soon we get bored and, it, and we kind of give up on it. But even though we may fail at it, we know deep down that it is important and that it is effective. I think if we were to boil down our issue to one thing, and there's a lot of things we could say about why we fail to pray. The number one thing would be this. We fail to pray because we believe we are self-sufficient. Years ago, a Norwegian pastor, Ole Halsby, wrote a wonderful little book on prayer. And he poses this question. He says, what is the attitude of heart which recognizes prayer? And here's what he says. In the first place, 
it is helplessness. This is the first and surest indication of a praying heart. As far as I can see, prayer has been ordained only for the helpless. It is the last resort of the helpless, indeed the very last way out. We try everything before we finally resort to prayer. Prayer and helplessness, he writes, are inseparable. We fail to pray because deep down we believe that we don't need to. We don't see ourselves as needy. We don't see ourselves as people needing the Lord. But very often in life, there will be situations that will make us feel that helplessness. And suddenly, it's not very difficult to pray, is it? Suddenly, it feels like the most natural thing in the world to begin praying. But prayer, is it that those moments perhaps have revealed to us, not, it's, it's not a new situation, but it's, what it's done is it's revealed the fact that we have been helpless all along. And for the Christian, the Christian life from beginning to end is one of helplessness. This morning we're going to look at a passage from, we're, we're looking at 1 John 5, but we're going to reference a passage in John 15. And in those, that passage, Jesus says this to his disciples, apart from me, you can do nothing. You, like, the Christian life from beginning to end is one of utter dependence upon Jesus Christ. We pray because we are helpless, and because it is the means God has given for us to commune with him. Prayer is the breath of the soul, the organ by which we receive Christ in our parched and withered hearts. Prayer is a treasure because God has given it to us as a means to commune with us. And God amazingly has promised, and this is be our main point this morning, God has promised to hear and answer our prayers. He promises to draw close to us in our need and act on our behalf. And so let us turn to 1 John chapter 5, if you're not already there. But let's, let us first pray to the Lord who hears us. Heavenly Father, we come before you helpless and needy. Apart from you, we can do nothing. We know, Lord, that to approach your throne is only an act of grace. And so this morning we approach your throne in the name of Jesus Christ. And we ask that through your Holy Spirit, you would speak to us this morning through your word. Instruct us. Teach us how to pray, Lord, so that we might have a, a deeper intimacy with you, that you may draw near to our hearts, change us, and motivate us. This is our wish and our desire, Lord, and this morning we, we bring these things before you. Again, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, the passage we are focusing on this, this morning comes at the conclusion of the letter of 1 John. And so it's not surprising that uh, this section serves as a summary of the entire letter. And that's why we read in verse 13, John begins with these words where he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. John is telling us the reason for which he has written this letter. It's a summary statement. And if we continue through the remainder of these concluding verses, we'll find that, G that John mentions six times, uses this word, to know. So obviously, whatever John has written in this letter, it's, it's really primarily been about knowledge, about knowing something about God. So what was the issue this church was facing that John needed to remind them and reassure them of the things they were supposed to know? What had shaken the church's confidence in their salvation enough for John to need to pen this letter? And if we were to piece together some of the statements in the letter, we get, begin to uh, have a picture of the situation that was plaguing this church. Earlier, 
in chapter 2, verse 19, John speaks of those who went out from us. And so there's been a group of people that have left the church. And if we continue on in chapter 4, verse 2, the, what we find is that these individuals have denied that Christ had come in the flesh. And if we begin to put the pieces together, we begin to realize that the primary issue for these individuals was a discomfort with the death of Jesus. Their question and their struggle was, how could the divine Son of God, one who came from the Father, how could he suffer and die on a cross? And their answer around this question was that at Jesus' baptism, the divine Christ descended on Jesus, but then he departed from him prior to his death on the cross. They refused to see how the Son of God could suffer and die. But the letter, as we read it, begins to unpack the reasons why this is such a dangerous and compromising position to make. It affects everything. But this division that had arisen evidently shook up the church. People began to ask themselves, what if what they had been taught wasn't true? And if it wasn't, did they even know God? Did he hear their prayers? Did they have and possess eternal life? And John writes to assure his readers that they truly have come to know God and assure them of the eternal life they possess in Jesus Christ. And one of the implications of it is this issue that we're talking about this morning, which is prayer. He reminds them of the confidence that they can have that God hears and answers their prayers because they belong to Jesus Christ. And so this morning, we're going to focus almost exclusively on verses 14 to 15 as we talk about prayer. And the first point we want to make is this. Effective prayer has conditions. Effective prayer has conditions. And, and we might think to ourselves, well, how can that be? Because isn't everything about grace? And, and, and surely there, that, that's true. But if we read closely, we see that whenever we read about prayer, we find conditions attached. Let us look, I'm going to focus on three interrelated conditions that determine the effectiveness of our prayers. But let us first turn to what we read in verse 14. If we ask anything, John writes, according to his will, he hears us. Notice that it is upon this condition that he hears us and answers. For John continues in verse 15, and this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Verse 15, and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. In other words, God's answer is assured to those who pray according to his will. That's the first condition. There is a second condition, not found directly here, but it's implied at the statement at the end of our text. When, when John says that we belong, that we are in his son, Jesus Christ. But this, this idea is made explicit in John 15, verse 7. In John 15, 7, Jesus instructs his disciples and says, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. But, again, we find a condition. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. The third condition we found is within 1 John. And it's chapter, found in chapter 3, verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. We see here, what we see here is that, the, that prayer is conditioned on our obedience to Jesus. We receive what we ask because we keep his commandments. And so I want to look at all three of these in turn. 
These three conditions could be summarized this way. The first is this, listening to Jesus, belonging to Jesus, and obeying Jesus. Let us look at this first one. The first condition of effective prayer is that we are listening to Jesus. Clearly, to know God's will can only happen if he has communicated his will to us. Often, I think many of us make the mistake when we're praying, Lord, Lord, show me, reveal to me your will. What we're asking in those moments is that God would give us some insight into the future. And certainly there's a time and there's a place for that. But to pray according to God's will isn't, that, 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 that's not what John means here. To pray according to God's will is to pray in accordance with his revealed word, in, in accordance with the scriptures. John tells us that we can ask for anything, which does not limit us in who or what situation we pray for, but praying according to his will instructs us in how we pray. And and let, let us use an example. Imagine for a moment a man named John, let's say. Recently, John has had a hard time at work. Mainly, he's had one difficulty, and it's a man named Andy. I'm sorry if there's any Andys out there. I'm just throwing out names. Andy is one of those people that constantly makes John's life miserable. So that every day when John comes home, his wife asks him the question, so what did Andy do today? Andy is lazy. He has almost no initiative. He complains whenever things get get even remotely difficult, and he never stops talking. Working with Andy has turned into a nightmare for John. And so each morning before going to work, John prays, Lord, please assign Andy to another department. Help him find another job. I can't take it anymore. But the other day, something happened with John. As he was in his devotional time, he was brought to the Sermon on the Mount. And he read Jesus' words, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And John began to think, he's thinking to himself, surely Andy isn't persecuting me. But do I really love Andy? And then he came to the Lord's Prayer and read, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. All along he'd been looking at what Andy did and didn't do, and hadn't looked at his reactions to Andy. He wanted Andy to change, but perhaps God wanted him to change. Suddenly his prayers began to change. Lord, may you be glorified in me today, John prayed. Forgive me for my impatience with Andy. And forgive me for the sin in his forgive him for the sin in his life. Lead him towards you. Give me an opportunity to witness to Andy. Lord, give me patience to love him as you love him. Do you, do you hear the difference? John is still praying for the same situation. Andy has not ceased to be a problem at work. But it is John and his prayer that has changed. And I don't know about you, there have been a lot of times where I have gone into prayer hoping that God would contradict himself in his word. When I read God's word, it makes me uncomfortable because it real, I have to realize that I have to take stock of myself. Praying according to his will is, is tough business. But God is not apparent that we can wear down with our nagging and with our own desires and wishes. John Stott writes this, prayer is not a convenient device for imposing our will upon God or for bending his will to ours, but, prescri- but a prescribed way of subordinating our will to his. It is by prayer that we seek God's will, embrace it, and align ourselves with it. And so we begin to see how the value of prayer is intimately tied to the value we spoke of last week, to God's word. Prayer is not a monologue. It's a dialogue. It's a conversation. And it's always a conversation that God, where God has spoken first. 
We can speak to God only when we first listened to him. We do not instinctively know what to pray for, but God's word tells us. Let's turn to our second condition. We must belong to Jesus. If we look at the the verse from John 15, verse 7, notice that the term Jesus used to refer to belonging is this term abide. It's one of John's favorite terms in his gospel. We are to abide in him. And we might translate this in a more common English as, as make our home with him. But how do we belong to Jesus and how can we possibly abide in him? Uh, we're all aware, aren't we, that on any given day there is a part deep within us that is like the prodigal son that wants to rebel, that wants to leave home. And if it were up to us, we could not make our home with Jesus. But in that same passage, in John 15, verse 4, Jesus says something amazing. Abide in me, he says, as I also abide in you. Jesus has made his home in us. Edwin Hoskins, in his commentary, says, this does not mean that if the disciples abide in him, he will abide in them, but rather Because he abides in them, they are enabled to fulfill his command to abide in him. Jesus is the one that gives us the ability to abide in him. It's not from ourselves. And because Jesus has made his home in us, we are able to speak to the Father. And suddenly we begin to understand for the reason for this condition to prayer. If Jesus makes his home in us and we in him, it means that we are identified with him and he with us. And so when God the Father looks on you as you are praying, he sees his perfect son, Jesus Christ, making those requests to him. The only way that we know what to pray for is because Jesus Christ indwells within us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so all true prayer begins and ends with God. God is the one who sends Jesus Christ, who dwells within our hearts, that gives us the words to speak back to the Father. It is all grace. Without this belonging to Jesus, our prayers are futile. Who would dare approach the throne of God with their requests? Without Jesus Christ, it is like crying into the void. I once had a friend whose telephone number was only one number different than a local dentist's. And almost every day, they received a phone call from somebody who made a mistake while they were dialing, and they called their house. And you'd always get these different reactions from people. Some people would actually begin to argue with them and say, in fact, uh, no, uh, this has to be the right number. This is the dentist. But it doesn't matter how much you protest or argue back. You you didn't call the dentist. There's no dentist here. And so it is apart from Christ. To pray without knowing Jesus Christ, we don't know who is on the other end of the line. And on what basis do we know whether the one we pray to can ever even hear us. But when we turn to God's word, we find this incredible promise that if we make our home in Christ, the Father hears and answers us. Our third condition is closely related to this one. The third condition we saw was this. The third condition is that we obey Jesus Christ's And we looked at 1 John chapter 3. As much as prayer is always a matter of God's grace, his grace is not such that we can continue to live in sin and expect to gain a hearing. To have Jesus make his home within us cannot leave us unchanged. If you're driving through a neighborhood, you can always tell the house that's unoccupied, can't you? The weeds grow tall. The roof starts to 
to go, starts to leak, maybe the roof collapses. It doesn't take long for a house to show signs of not being occupied. And so it is with us. If our hearts are not occupied by Jesus Christ, our lives will show it. One of the more difficult sections of our passage, and I'm skipping over the most difficult one, but one of the more difficult ones is verse 18. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. And in the same vein, in chapter 3, verse 9, John writes something similar when he says, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. And so right, right at face value, we think to ourselves, am I even saved? I, I, I know myself, I sin on a daily basis. But if we read it on face value, it seems to contradict what we find in chapter 5, verse 16, where John tells us and instructs us to pray, if anyone sees a brother committing a sin, we are to pray for them. And so obviously, John means something different in verse 18. John doesn't mean that our lives will be uh, free of sin completely. And so if we look again at chapter 3, verse 9, when John tells us that believers have been born of God and that God's seed is within them, what he is saying is that for the unbeliever, sin is natural. But for the believer, being born again, being born of God, sin has now become an unnatural thing. If you were to take a fish and throw it on land, how long does it last? Not very long. Because it belongs in water. And what John is saying is, a believer cannot keep on practicing sin and be comfortable with it because it's like that fish thrown onto land. It doesn't belong there. It, it's no longer in its natural habitat. To have God's seed within us makes sin unnatural. And so if we look at the pattern of a believer's life, it is a movement towards increasing sinlessness. This life not only expresses itself in action, but also grows. The more that this divine seed transforms the Christian, the more impossible it is for them to sin. And so... When we come to the Lord in prayer, we must examine ourselves and say, is there any sin within me? For a Christian to actively engage in an ongoing pattern of sin, it, it takes a willfulness to move in a direction opposite to that new nature. If we saw a fish trying to climb up on land, we'd think there's something wrong with that fish. And it's the same with ourselves. Even though a believer will continue to struggle with sin and feel drawn to, a, to it, there will always be a part deep within that will make them feel out of place in it. To continue in habitual sin, we have to ignore God screaming into our ears to stop. And if we're not willing to listen to God's voice, then why would he listen to yours and mine? First, examine your heart. Change. And then you can bring your petitions before the Lord. And that's the condition that John is saying here, is we, have, we can have that confidence because we keep his commandments. Because in my life, I am pursuing Jesus Christ. And I want to do what pleases him. But so far, we've been talking about conditions. But then we come to this marvelous truth. And the second point is this. Effective prayer is confident. We find that in this text. A Christian has confidence that their prayer is heard and will be answered. Notice the certainty with which John writes in these verses. In verses 14 to 15. He speaks, first of all, of the confidence that if we ask anything according to his will, anything according to his will, and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. We know. 
there's a part of us, I think, that flinches at this level of certainty. And the biggest reason is that many of us, I think, have had prayers that have remained unanswered. They could be prayers for healing, uh, reconciled relationships, freedom from pain, financial stability, and so on. And we ask ourselves, why did I not get an answer? And even though we've talked about those conditions, we always have to be cautious because there's always going to be that thought of, is there sin? And sometimes, yes, indeed, there is a sin going on in our lives. But sometimes that's not the case. I think, first of all, we, I'd say this, we can often flatter ourselves into thinking we have a better perspective on how God should answer our prayer. Many times, for instance, we'll talk about wrestling with God in prayer. You ever heard people talk about this? I really wrestled with God in prayer. But Oliver O'Donovan, uh, he's a Christian theologian, he's surely right when he comments, wrestling in prayer is wrestling with ourselves, not with God. To say we wrestle with God is to invest too much in ourselves. God knows what he's doing. We don't. Let's not pretend we do. Very often the Lord calls us to return to prayer and persist in it because it is we who need changing in our prayers. We're not praying for the right things. And he will eventually reveal that to us. But even when we have wrestled ourselves closer to the Lord's will in prayer, there are always those prayers that remain unanswered, aren't there? But surely no one expects prayer to be answered in the next 60 seconds, right? If we did, I think everyone would have holes in our genes. We'd be praying constantly about everything. But the reality, and so the question is, well, what's an adequate length of time for God to answer that prayer? The reality is that many prayers are answered in ways we cannot see, or they are answered in ways different than we anticipated, or maybe they have not yet been answered, but they will be. The reality, I think, is that those who pray know that God does answer. As one person put it, if answers to prayer are just coincidence, I sure have a lot more coincidences when I pray than when I don't. But we don't need our experiences to tell us that, do we? Because God has promised it in his word to us. Think of Jesus' statement in Luke chapter 9. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Isn't this clear enough? And motive for, enough, for us enough to return to prayer confident and expectant of God answering and hearing our prayers. God does not tease us with his promises and go, uh, oh, sorry, not this time. That's not the way God works. Charles Spurgeon wrote, I cannot imagine any one of you tantalizing your child by exciting in him a desire that you did not intend to gratify. It were a very ungenerous thing to offer alms to the poor, and then when they hold out their hand for it, to mock their poverty with a denial. It would be a cruel thing to the miseries of the sick if they were taken to the hospital and they're left to die untended and uncared for. Where God leads you to pray, he means you to receive. Do we have this confidence in prayer? How often do we pray with a backup plan? We pray expecting that he will not answer and we will not receive. And so what we do instead is we busy ourselves with our plans. Maybe we make ourselves so busy that we don't even have time to pray anymore. You know, I'm so worried about this or that, I just have no time to pray. We try to manage every last detail of our life in hopes that we can, we can somehow change the outcome. And then we wonder why everything seems too hard or too, or too difficult to bear or to manage. God has given us prayer because he knows how helpless we are without him. 
and he wants to give good gifts to his children. Remember Jesus' parable in that same passage. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, gives instead a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, says, hey, here's a scorpion. No one, no father would do that. And Jesus says that if that's the way that human fathers behave, how much more will the heavenly father, who is a true good father, do for his children? Let me ask you a question. If God never answered any of our prayers, but we still had salvation through Jesus Christ, would God still be good? Is it God himself that we are seeking to commune with in prayer? Or are we merely trying to get things out of him? All of our problems that we pray for ultimately find their answer in the resurrection. D.A. Carson's fond of saying, there's no problem we face that a good resurrection can't fix. And isn't that true? If God were not to answer any of our prayers, but we have salvation in Jesus Christ, God is still good. God is still gracious. The amazing thing is that God does answer our prayer. That he does care for our needs. He cares for, we are to pray for our daily bread. For those things that, those common everyday things. We can bring anything to the Lord in prayer. There's so many stories about prayer I could share, and I want to close with this one. I came across this, uh, John Ortberg shares the story, but it's from uh, Tony Campolo, if you know Tony Campolo. Well, Tony Campolo was at a prayer meeting at a Pentecostal college chapel service. Eight men, before he began to speak, took him to a back room, and they began to pray for him. And, and Tony talks about how they laid their hands on his head, and they began to pray. And he said there's a point where he started to realize that this prayer was getting awfully long. And even the, the, those praying seemed to be getting tired because he began to feel the pressure on the back of his head as they were kind of getting more and more tired. They were leaning more and more on his head. And to make matters worse, one of the men was not even praying for Tony anymore. He went on and, and was praying for somebody named Charlie Stol Stolfus. Dear Lord, you know Charlie Stolfus? He lives in that silver trailer down the road a mile. You know the trailer, Lord, just down the road on the right-hand side. And Tony thought to himself, we don't need to know about where the guy lives. Some, God knows where he lives. Like, just, just get over with. Lord, Charlie told me this morning he's going to leave his wife and three kids. Step in and do something, God. Bring that family back together. So finally, the prayer ended. He delivered his message, and he got in his car, and he began to drive home. And as he drove onto the Pennsylvania Turnpike, he noticed a hitchhiker. And this is what Tony writes. He picks him up, and he says, we drove a few minutes, and I say, hi, my, my name's Tony Campolo. What's yours? Well, my name's Charlie Stolfitz. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I got off the Turnpike at the next exit and headed back. And he began to get a bit uneasy, and after a few minutes, he said, hey, mister, well, you know, where are you taking me? I said, I'm taking you home. He narrowed his eyes and asked, why? Because you just left your wife and three kids, right? And that blew him away. Yeah, yeah, that's right. With shock written all over his face, he plastered himself against the car door and never took his eyes off me. Then I really did him in as I drove right to his silver trailer when I pulled up, his eyes seemed to bulge as he asked, how did you know I lived here? I said, God told me. I believe God did tell me. And when he opened the trailer door, his wife exclaimed, you're back, you're back. He whispered in her ear, and the more he talked, the bigger her eyes got. Then I said with real authority, the two of you sit down. I'm going to talk, and you two are going to listen. Man, did they listen. That afternoon, I led those two young people to Jesus Christ. 
do we believe that God hears and answers our prayers? And so the question is, do we spend time in God's word so we know what to pray for as we should? Do you make time to pray? If you don't make time, it won't happen. But more importantly, do you expect an answer? And when you don't get it, do you persist knowing that God is going to answer that request? We talked about conditions, and we need to examine our, our lives and our hearts, but we, we need to leave today knowing that we have a confidence through Jesus Christ that God hears and answers our prayers. And that is why we value prayer. What is God going to do through Victory Baptist Church? Through prayer. We can't do it without it. We can't achieve our mission without it. And so we need to value it in our lives and in this church. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, how good you are that you hear us. It's all grace, Lord. You give us the words to speak, and so we speak them. You open your ears to our cries, and you answer them. Lord, you indwell us so that we can carry out Lord, your your commands in our lives so that we can live as changed people. From beginning to end, Lord, prayer is all about you and from you. We are so undeserving, Lord, of this great gift that you have given to us that we can talk to you. Help us not to take it for granted. May we make time in our our lives and in our schedules to pray. May we be reminded, Lord, that we are truly helpless, that apart from you, we can do nothing. And Lord, the more that we, may we just be more and more uh, drawn to that acknowledgement in our lives, and may we see you do great things as a result. As the more we become helpless, may we see more and more of your power at work in us and through us. So, Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't it amazing that we can be confident in Jesus? We can be confident in our prayers because our prayers are answered. And so as we take all of these things to the Lord in prayer, may we sing of that great confidence that we have. For we have a great friend in Jesus and he is interceding for us all the time.
our burdens bear. May we ever, Lord, be bringing all to Thee in earnest prayer. Soon in glory bright and clouded, there will be no need for prayer. Rapture, praise, and endless worship will be our sweet portion there. <laughs> Lord, we pray this morning for rapture, praise, and endless worship. We look forward to the future that we have with you in heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. We'd like to close the service with a few announcements. This first announcement is of grave importance. If you are between the ages of three and the end of junior high, so grade nine, like 15? That sounds about right. If you're between the ages of three and 15, we are excited to tell you once again that there are lots of things going on this summer for you throughout the month of August. We have our virtual online camp experiences. For children ages 3 to 11, we have our Victory Explorers online camp, and we would love to have you join us. And for those of you who are between the ages of 11 and 15, we have our junior high camp that will be happening throughout the month of August as well. All of the information that you will need to attend this camp, to be a part of what we're doing, can be found on our website where you can also register to give us an idea of how many people will be joining us. We are so looking forward to having this opportunity to share the gospel with you and also with all of your friends and your family. So please invite as many people as you can to join us this summer. We can't wait to really dig into God's word with you. Got some good news to share with you. Uh, next weekend, we're going to be reopening our doors for Sunday morning service. I know it's been a long time coming, and it's, it's great to be at this place. And I also understand with, within opening up with all the restrictions and that, there are people who will be uncomfortable coming back and just aren't ready to come back right away. And I understand that. We respect that and know that we're going to continue to live stream our services. We're not leaving anyone behind. We're going to work through this together. Uh, what we are going to do for reopening is on Wednesday of this week, we're going to upload on our website and social media just the, the steps that you will need to take to return to in-person worship. And the big thing that I want you to know is you will need to register uh, to attend. That's a big piece in all of this. You might ask, why do I have to register to come to church? Well, part of it is because we have restricted um, a restriction on how many people can uh, be seated in the auditorium, we have limited seating. So we need to kind of prepare for your visit and understand how many people will be coming each week to be able to work through those details. So please watch the website. We'll send out an email to the church family about how you can return with us to worship and all the details that go along with that. But we're looking forward to seeing you as uh, time goes on. Pastor Jason? Well, as we close, I realize that for many of us, these have been anxious times in many ways. And as we talked about prayer, what a great comfort it is that we can bring those anxieties before the Lord. And I want to close with these words from the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in pr everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. And may the peace of God go with you this week. God bless you.